This week we dive back into the book, back into Earth's Forbidden Secrets by Max Egan. And this week's episode is called Creation, Evolution, or Door Number Three, where we get into alternate theories and different pieces of evidence of what is the evolution of Homo sapiens sapien. I really enjoyed doing the book. This one's been in the bag for a little while. Bodhi and the 9-11 boys jumped the queue, so you'll hear that we reference the 9-11 podcast, which for those who haven't listened to it, please go back and give that one a listen. Very, very interesting. That'll be about it for me. I'm trying to organise some other stuff with Loomis and a few of the other boys. It's hard to line schedules up. However, there's some awesome conversations on the way. Remember on Patreon, unlocking the code, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Uh, give us a follow, give us a like, give us a review. The world continues to be an interesting place. I'm not sure what music we're going to go with this time. I'll check that one out. However, enjoy that. And just look after yourselves. Be kind, be cool, stay safe. And we'll talk soon. Cheers. Especially enjoyed that one. Let's see what's next. Mate. Hello. How are you going? Hi. Hi. How are you? Oh, mate, I'm buzzing from that bit of Patreon content that we just created. That's right. We just, uh, yeah. 
Mate, that was a tasty little bit of conversation and thought provoking. Thought provoking. Thought provoking. Very thought provoking. Yeah. Anyway, so we're back again. I think it's number 13. Is it 13? I've lost count. I don't even know. Just like my age. Yeah. I don't know how old I am. That's okay. We'll say it's 13 and I'll figure it out in the post. Run with that. So we had a bit of a look at a couple of articles. We thought we'd go back to some of the old. Oh, before we do that, though. Just quietly between you and me and the fence post, mate. Uh, did the nine eleven podcast with Chris and Daniel, mm-hmm. and yeah, those boys come with receipts, man. Oh, really? They uh, honestly, right now, uh, you would have to convince me it wasn't an inside job. Yeah, yeah. After and look. Even deeper, even more so yeah, than before. Absolutely. Amazing. But of course, I'm going to release it on 9-11 because I thought that was appropriate. Definitely is. So I look forward to that one. However, yeah, that's going to really, be a good episode. It is a good episode. I'm looking man. forward to it, bro. Yeah. If you're saying they got more, they've built upon the narrative, then that feels, you know. That's well, excellent. it's more the backstory that those boys presented yep. as well. Yep. It was less about the links the, to the Saudis yeah, and yeah, stuff there was, like that. Yeah, even deeper, you know. Yep. And it was we only probably spent it was less about the day and more about everything that led up to the day. Yeah. And there's just you know, I, I heard something, uh it was actually a cosmographia. We'll start with Randall straight up. No, it was a cosmographia episode. Uh we just love Randall. I do, man. man. He's, He's just good. good dude. Anyway, uh it was one of the other guys on the Cosmographia, not uh, the Snake Bros. One, I can't remember the other dude's name. However, he said, uh, coincidence takes planning. And I actually... Well, in the Patreon content, didn't I just say that? Yeah. That's how That's how you tie... No, I'm not even going to say it. No. I'm going to leave that a secret. But didn't I mention it? You did. I did. You did. And uh, yeah, so... I don't know. Anyway, you guys can have a listen to that one in a little while. We're going to go with first article, and I think Leslie and Martin. Oh, like this we one. haven't we haven't said the uh, initialism yet. It's EFS. Yeah, it is EFS number yeah. thirteen. Yeah, yeah. We didn't say EFS though. We we're just like, is this number thirteen? Is this number thirteen? It is. Well, people know, man. It's an EFS episode. It's an EFS. Just episode. in case you were yeah. guessing. Look, the... <laughs> even though it was written when you downloaded it, you clicked on the top. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> well, the thing that we were on a roll, we're like, hang on a minute, we're here to do an EFS. We better get started. Yeah. So we're sort of 40 minutes in, uh, yet not really. Anyway, we are. We are doing an EFS, and we're going to do some articles. We're going to go back we to the original. Do. Uh, the format. Mm. Let's run into it. Go. And look, the last what episode, this one here, Earth. This <laughs> Sorry, man. Giant just... magnetic waves from Earth's core started. Earth has just started emitting giant magnetic waves from its core. Now, like, like when they say just started, so it, it emits magnetic a magnetic field yeah. all the time. But this is what we're going to learn, right? This is what, the, and the reason this one caught my eye is because look, myself and Grub, and turns out you're researching in the background, not even knowing about it through the zeitgeist. However. Uh, we're looking back into anti-gravitic Otis Carr territory. We might even go back to the book. I don't know. We, we, there's some rumblings. There's rumblings of the book. There's rumblings of going back to Otis's book and picking and choosing some stuff. Um, however, yeah, it's all to do with magnets. Magnets is the answer. Uh, if we could harness the magnetic field, then what else would we need? But anyway, we're, let's let's not go into that right now. Earth has just started emitting giant magnetic waves from its from its core. Now, this is the spaceacademy.org by Team Physics Astronomy. Okay. Earth's interior is far from a quiet place. Deep below our surface activities, the planet rumbles with activity. From plate tectonics to convection currents that circulate through the hot magmatic fluids far beneath the crust. See, I love these pictures, right? but they don't really know that that's what it looks like, okay? Mm. That is a computer generation of what they think it looks like. Mm. Okay, that's this is, we always need to take that into account. 100%. Now scientists studying satellite data of Earth have identified something inside Earth we've never seen before, 
a new type of magnetic wave that sweeps around the surface of our planet's core every seven years. This discovery could offer insight into how Earth's magnetic field is generated and provide clues of our planet's thermal history and evolution. That is the gradual cooling of the planetary interior. They're not going to go global warming, are they? Please don't. They're talking about global temperatures. Visualization. I like this. I've I've had plenty of visualizations of the waves at the core mantle boundary. Just one piece of info that sort of just popped into mind is that, you know, the core is meant to be like molten iron. Yeah. When iron gets to a certain temperature, it becomes non-magnetic. Right. Yeah. Like that happened. That's, that's a test when you're like doing knives. Like if you want to heat something to the point where you can bash it with a hammer, you heat it till it's non-magnetic. Yeah, because it becomes malleable. Yeah, then it's soft enough yeah, to, yeah. yeah, that's like a telltale. Yeah, right. That's interesting. I don't think the core is that big either, but anyway, I don't know. No one uh, really knows. No, exactly. Geophysicists have long theorized over the existence of such waves, but they thought they were to take place over much longer time scales than our research has shown, says geophysicist Nicholas Gillett. Or Gillet, I would say, because it's France. Yeah. France. Yeah. The oh, University of Grenoble Alps Gillette. in France. Gillette. Measurements of the magnetic field from instruments based on the surface of Earth suggested that there was some kind of wave action. But we needed the global co- coverage offered by measurements from space to reveal what's actually going on. <clears throat> we combined satellite measurements from Swarm and also from the earlier German CHAMP mission and Danish Orsted mission with the computer model of the geodynamo to explain what the ground-based data had thrown up, and this led to our discovery. Earth's magnetic field is a subject of much fascination for scientists. Research to date suggests that the invisible structure forms a protective bubble around our planet, keeping harmful radiation out and the atmosphere in, thus allowing life to thrive. But the magnetic field isn't static. It fluctuates in strength, size, and shape and has features we don't understand and is gradually weakening over time. Do we know that? Over whose time? How long have we been measuring it? That's it. Is it... 50 years? Is this... If they're measuring a decrease in the ma- the magnetics, does that mean that it, it's going to become continually less? Because the core is cooling i guess mm. they're alluding to mm. so the the field's changing or is it just another wave in the cycle mm. you know yes it's on a downward trajectory mm. but then it if you look at it over a long enough period of time mm-hmm. it's actually waves mm. are they talking about magnetic waves All right so maybe we're just in a as you say in the, in the trough of the wave yeah uh <clears throat> The reason that activity inside our planet is important is because that's where the magnetic field comes from. It's generated by a dynamo, a rotating, convecting, and electrically conducting fluid that converts kinetic energy into magnetic energy, spinning a magnetic field out into space around the planet. That fluid is mostly the molten iron inside Earth's outer core. The European Space Agency swarm satellites are a trio of identical probes launched in 2013 and hanging out in the Earth orbit to study activity inside Earth, with a specific eye on the magnetic and dynamic activity coming out of the core. It was in this data that Gillette and his team discovered the fascinating new waves. They then studied data from other ground and space-based observatories collected between 99 and 2021 and found a pattern. These waves, known as magneto Coriolis waves are huge magnetic columns aligned along Earth's rotational axis, strongest at the equator. They sweep around the boundary between the core and the mantle with an amplitude of around 3 kilometres per year and move westward at a rate of up to 1,500 kilometres per year. Their existence suggests that other magneto-coriolis waves might exist with different oscillation periods, which we are unable to detect to date due to lack of data. This is interesting. Magnetic waves are likely to be triggered by disturbances deep within the Earth's fluid core, possibly related to buoyancy plumes. Well, okay. All right. I can say, so they're saying the spinning, it becomes, like, I don't know, something becomes buoyant and makes it wobble or something inside yeah. the core. And the, the core itself has like density 
differences yeah, different in density, it, which yeah. causes different areas to be yeah the fluid would react differently if it's spinning around inside there i suppose yeah exactly it's like think of the surface of jupiter mm. but now now shrink that down into a molten core instead of a gaseous giant mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is, that's the mental image that i'm making yeah i can see that uh our research suggests that other such waves are likely to exist probably probably blah 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 will be bloody hell I wrote that one out for a comic effect. Did you like that? I did. Yeah, with longer periods. But their discovery relies on more research. For now, because waves can carry waves carry information about the medium through the which they travel, the new discovery could be used to probe the interior of our planet in new ways, including the core, which is difficult to study, as well as the core mantle boundary. See, in that sentence, they're basically saying they don't know, right? I mean, I think the deepest we've drilled is 26 Ks, I think. Yeah, uh, but then, the, but then the you Earth? also got like the volcanic faults and stuff like that. Well, the, one of the one of the things because... I saw a little while ago is they they're using like advanced like mass like I suppose ground penetrating radar on steroids. Yep, and finding massive voids within the planet. That's yep. not you know the the picture that's in geology books is not is just a picture. Yep. Uh, the team's research has been published in PNAS. That's it. <laughs> penis. <laughs> yeah, penis. It's been published in <laughs> penis. Yeah. <laughs> Bloody didn't they didn't think about that, did they? Anyway. Look, I think that's fascinating. Look, the magnets thing, man, it's I don't want to get off on the tangent on the magnets too much. However, it's interesting that they're measuring different magnetic fields. Uh I think as I say, I I think magnets are the answer in a lot of ways. However, it's it's cool the technology that's coming along that's allowing us to do this, I think. No, nah, hundred percent, man. I agree with you. Okay. Magnets are very interesting because of just their observable qualities. Mm. You know, they're available to everyday people mm. and you can make cool things with them. Mm. Well, we're going back to some uh Back to the ancient civilizations, and it's your turn, mate. Thank you, sir. Right. This is a little old, this article. I didn't see that. It was a... Oh, 2016. We didn't pick up on that bit. All right, so. That was good dead air. Appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> Took me a while to realize what the hell I was doing. I didn't realize I'd taken the wheel. <laughs> My bad. All right, so. Updated 27th of November 2016 at at 2.50. It's very, it's very speci- accurate. Very it? specific. Very specific. By Clyde Winters. All right, let's talk a little bit about pre-Columbian murals and Norse sagas suggest Vikings met the Aztecs and the outcome was not pretty. Did the Vikings visit pre-Columbian Mexico? The depiction of white people on Chichen Itza Murals in the Temple of the Warriors probably represent Vikings. The major European navigators around the time this temple was built. This suggests the tradition of the white lords who had visited Mexico before the Spanish were the Vikings. Look, they could... I mean, there's loose evidence of Vikings coming to Australia, mate. You know what I mean? Like, Yeah. Well, and the Vikings landed in Newfoundland. Yeah. So... They made it to the continent, at least. Mm-hmm. They just had to travel south along the coastline. Which they probably would have done. Because they did. Yeah. That's what they did. That's what they do. <laughs> so, yeah, every 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 bit's possible. Mm. Norse sagas discussing voyages that may have landed in Mexico. Oh, there you go. Trying to... Good luck with that. Hans Ebling published the book, Die Ries in die Vergen... Eight, three, whatever. The, yeah. They Europe yeah, win and, uh, and the rest yeah, of, yeah. The know, rest of all that stuff. Just doesn't... stuff written in Norse, yeah. uh, whatever, Dutch. I don't know. In 1789, in his text, Hebling talked about how Moctezuma the mm. second welcomed Hernan Cortes as Quetzalcoatl, Goran Man, 
uh, Norse name and Bjorn Thor's Norse name translated Evelyn's book into Icelandic. They discussed, discussed the, uh, discussed the, uh, how do you put two G's in the air, Norse? <laughs> Erbiga, Old, no- Erbiga, how do you even Saga, say that? Erbiga, sta- uh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Air biggie. Biggie? I don't this know. This is yeah. E-Y-R-B-G-G-I-A. Yeah. All right. We've spent long enough on that. That's boring. Saga in the epilogue. This is difficult. It is. It seems to work. Oh, man. This saga mentions two possible Vikings you, you, who may have sailed to the Yucatan region of Mexico. We'll just say Goodleaf and Bjorn. There you go. There you go. So Goodleaf and Bjorn. And, and then let's go down and just say Norseman and Viking man claim that the sa- that, that saga describes how Bjorn, another Viking man. Yeah, Bjorn. No, that's Bjorn. Oh, Bjorn, the champion yeah. of the Broadwickers. Oh, yeah. I didn't read the next section. Around Ireland and landed in Mexico. All right, so... They sailed to the Yucatan because they sailed around Ireland and, and landed, landed in, in Mexico. Mexico. Okay. Fair enough. Is that it? No. Oh, here oh, we go. I was Jeez, say. There was a few ads there we yeah, had to skip over. I thought it was the end too. <laughs> it's like that's not much of an article. It was updated. No. In- yeah. What the hell did you update? <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is the next part. There are also three traditions of the Norse sagas that mentioned that in 965 or 986, Ari Marston set sail from Ireland in attempt to reach Greenland. The story has it that Marston's ship ran into rough seas and a storm threw him off course. Within six days, he had reached Mexico instead. The That saga that we have spoke about and the voyage of Ari Marston may explain how the first white people got to the Yucatan. That's oh, got some murals there. Here we have some reliefs. Mural in the Temple of the Warriors in Chichen Itza. Okay, Mexico. The image shows light-skinned men as they pack to retreat by sea, while others defend a village or are taken away as prisoners. Yeah, right. Okay. Well, just, re- just remember the completely random reference, but getting down on the mountain. Remember that song we were listening yeah. to? So it says something like, um, what is it? Have you ever seen the eyes of a man whose kids haven't eaten for 17 17 days days and counting? That's right. Yeah. So you're going to be pretty wild. If you get off a ship that's been blown off course, you're probably hungry Mm. and you're desperate. So you're coming in swinging. And you're Viking, so you're ready to go. That's right. Yeah. You'll be in the halls of Valhalla Mm. if you die in, in, I was going to say prison then, in battle. We're off to a flyer. We are flying, my <laughs> friend. We are flying. <laughs> the White Lord's Return. Many researchers claimed that tens of thousands of indigenous people helped Hearn and Cortez conquer the, the Mexica Aztecs in 1519. They formed a confederation of a number of disparate peoples who wanted to throw off the Aztec yoke. Some researchers claim that the tribes joined the conquistadors in defeating the Aztecs because they represented a return of the white lords. However, most researchers say that this story about white lords Mm. was a myth created during the Spanish conquest. Restall wrote that the legend of the returning lords originated during the Spanish-Mexico War in Cortez's reworking of Moctezuma's welcome speech had by the 1550s merged with the Cortez as Quetzalcoatl legend that the Franciscans had started spreading in the 1530s. Mm. Now, let's not forget history is written by the victor. That's right. So That's right. that there is... It's very possible. Yeah, the reason we killed everyone is because we were the white lords that had come back across the ocean. That's right. Yeah. Now, in saying that, in every fable, there is a, a sliver of truth. Mm-hmm. So, 
was it was the story prompted to be written because some someone had a genetic memory of it already existing because well, there's nothing new under the sun yeah there's genetic memory but i think the the story of south america is interesting because yeah i've heard a lot of people that story what you just heard then is how they write off the advanced ancient stuff yeah because the the story that i heard was um that a yeah the the bearded man and the beautiful woman came across the sea in it with a ship with no sails and landed and basically taught us everything yep that's the story right which is the survivor story of the cataclysm which is and they used that the fact that Cortez just said, no, no, it was me sort of thing. Yeah. So maybe that's the story, right? So, okay. And maybe it predates Vikings or maybe exactly. the Vikings um, were... A, we're welcomed as the White Lords. Yeah. That's right. That, yeah, they might have done. The White Lords thing already existed. Yeah. They're like, oh, White Lords are back. Yeah. The pre-flood, the pre-Diluvian guys are yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, Sweet. Let's yeah. teach well, us some things. Yeah. No. We came to rape and pillage. That's right. This is what we do. Yes. However, yeah, look, it's it's interesting. Mm. It's interesting. Okay, next section. But this story of white lords in pre-Columbian Mexico may make sense. The Temple of the Warriors in Chichen Itza suggests that Europeans had visited Mexico between 600 and 900 AD. Murals in the temple depict black, white, and brown people. It's so, oh, yes. Yeah. Are we, are we boring you, mate? Are you okay? In some of these murals, <laughs> I, I made that noise so you can cut that big yawn out. Okay. That's why I went ding. So you could pick it up on the sound line. Uh, and hang on, let me start again. In some of these murals, one can see whites fighting and in bondage to blacks. Interesting. That's right. I have the mouse. Yes, yeah, you're in control, mate. I'm. I don't, I don't know about in control, <laughs> but I've got control. Oh yeah, you can see they're bound there. Yep. Yes, yes, yes. Interesting. Mm. Big dicks on them too. You could tell they're, you know, Vikings. tell they're Vikings. <laughs> what? Well, that? Why? Yeah, that's that's actually prominent in the picture, isn't it? Uh, the last the last paper was submitted to penis. Now we got. Yeah, now we got the penises on the bandage wall. Bandage dicks up here too. <laughs> So, anyway, the complex dance of the giants. Don't read my bit, man. Oh, sorry. I didn't read your bit. God. In Esotericism of the Popal V by Raphael Girard, one reads about the dance of the giants. This Mayan dance appears to represent a pre Columbian conflict between white and black people in Mexico. God, a lot of ads. This book is quite illuminating. In it, Gerard discusses the dance of the black giants. The dance of the black giants explains the reason why the other indigenous peoples joined the Spanish in destroying the Aztec nation. Gerard's description of the dance of the giants is startling, and he writes, In the following episode, Apparition, the vicissitudes undergone. I don't know what that word is. You had some rough words, man. Dude, that I've, that is it. That looks like an English word, and I don't know what it is. The vicissitudes, something like know. that. I don't know. Vici, Vici situdes. Anyway, it's a weird one. God, undergone by the white giant who has fallen into the hands of his rival, a mind. The black giant intimidates his opponent by beating the ground furiously with his sword while he makes menacing gestures and movements in hopes of touching or wounding the white giant, who defends himself as best he can by trying to evade and riposte the thrusts. The battle is suspended at intervals while the giants pay homage to the sun, but then immediately resumed with greater fury. During the whole episode, the black giant maintains a menacing stance, not only toward his rival, but also toward the large audience witnessing the spectacle. Both actors watch each other constantly, trying to take advantage of the smallest error of the other. 
for whole minutes. They are motionless like statues. Then cautiously cross swords as they dart glances around in all directions, as if fearing some invisible danger. Then they come to grips with each and each places the point of the sword against his opponent's neck. A tragic pose that lasts but an instant. Finally, the black giant succeeds in decapitating the white giant because his power is greater. An episode that for the Chorty presents the moment when our Lord was suffering under the dominion of the bad spirit. And That's play. interesting. Mm. Yeah, that could Where be interpreted going, another way. I don't know. It just could be interpreted a number of different ways. I mean, like you got the two giants facing off against each other. The light and the dark. The light and the dark and one, yeah. And the, dark, and the dark one the dark in one, that instance. instance. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, I wouldn't say that's Viking story, but anyway. Uh, yeah, well, when you've got a long bow to draw. Yeah, when you've got you've got a research paper that needs to be written. Yeah, exactly. So, the defeat of the white giant by the black giant is not the end of the dance. In the dance of the giants, a white person called Gavit returns to Mexico and helps the indigenous peoples defeat the black giants. Gerard explains. Oh, so the black, the, so it's not it's black and white fighting each other apart apart from the indigenous then. So yeah. And this word changes from giant to person, right? Mm. So it's like the people are watching two giants. Yeah, fight The each black other. and the white, maybe fight two gods. Yeah. Okay. Oh, there's more. Mm. Wow. Wow. I thought we were going back into the thing. Okay. Anyway, back into the, the story. Finally, Gavit decapitates the black giant and takes away his sword. After the giant humbly says to him, rest a moment, child, and I will give you your payment because I now yield myself and even my heart trembles. He acknowledges himself vanquished and a tribute payer to Gavit, them thenceforward. But the hero god replies, there is no rest now. So now we're into gods, hero gods. So is, the giants are now hero gods. Is Gavite the hero god or Gavite the hero god? I don't know. Maybe. I've lost it. It doesn't make sense. There is, I don't know. There is no rest now, boastful giant, because we are beginning the end of the labor. Hornada. We note here, for the reader's better understanding, that the word Hornada means task, act, or ceremony, and is a term frequently employed by Chorty elders in that sense. In which sense? Task, act, or ceremony? Because that, that didn't make... Look. Yeah. Look, I'm missing parts too. All, okay. right. All right. More, more. Go. Gerard continues the tale. We really picked some doozies tonight, we mate. We did some massive... <laughs> like EFS in itself. I know. There is no discrepancy between the Chorty and the quiche. <laughs> that's, that's what it says sources regarding the manner of killing the chief of the infernal forces Gavite cuts off his head just as Hunapu did that of Hun Kame in the Popol Vuh the first to be cut off was the head of the one called Hun Kame the great lord of Zabalba Offering the black giant's head and sword as trophies to the king and captain, Gavite says, Here I bring you the head of this giant, with a blade of steel from my sling. From my battle, it will overcome the whole world, since if you do not subdue it, it will be your subduer. The Chichen Itza mural indicates that the indigenous peoples had sided with the blacks, when the whites first attempted to invade Mexico. However, it later appears that they felt the black giants were arrogant and boastful and they wanted to overthrow them, even though they originally had helped defeat the Vikings. 
so so there hang on a minute yeah so where in this article are we going to talk about who are the blacks yeah who's the blacks because remember in the mural it depicts black brown and white yeah so i'm thinking that the aztecs are the brown people yeah you would say so and then the blacks and the whites are fighting Mm. so who are the black giants Mm. And are, who's are, and why are they hero gods? Are they the ones that there's statues of? Mm. You know, the um man I had it the other day. What are they called? Man, I hate this. Like I had I had a moment like this talking to someone about it the other day mm. and I forgot it. And then, you know, two days later it came back to me. Yep. The, well, let me know. The Olmec. The Olmec. Oh, the Olmec. There you go. I had to relax the brain. Had to relax, let it come just in. let it chill. That the new tropic settle yeah, in. Yeah. So the Olmecs. That's that's with the statues that look African. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, well they got yeah they got the like flat African nose features. and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep, yep. For sure. So are they the giant blacks? Could but be. Why is why are we talking about only the Vikings? Why aren't we talking about the giant blacks mm. as well? Mm. The dance of the giants probably represents the fight between the whites and blacks for power. The whites lost the battle, as depicted in the murals at Chichen Itza, but the Maya people were used used as pawns by the blacks to defeat the whites. In one of the murals, one can see a blonde-haired man being sacrificed by two black men. Okay. Fair yeah, enough. Fair enough. I like it. This is a massive article. This I, is I really didn't ginormous. Know. I'm going to need a rest after this. Describing the Aztecs, although many of the indigenous peoples sided with the blacks in their battle against the white invaders in pre-Columbian times, by the time the Spanish arrived in Mexico, the black rulers, namely the Aztecs, were mistreating the other groups of indigenous peoples. The Spanish described the Aztecs as followed. The people of this land are well made, rather tall, rather tall than short. They are swarthy as leopards, of good manners and gestures, for the greater part very skillful, robust, and tireless, and at the same time the most moderate men known. They are very warlike and face death with the greatest resolution. And there are some cool... Yeah, some to Spanish some cool depictions of say. They're right. Archaeological evidence, Mayan and Spanish descriptions, and pictorial evidence from the codices indicate the Aztecs may have been black people. This would not be surprising because the Paleo-Americans, Lucia and Naya, were also black. In addition to the Spanish describing the Aztecs as black, like leopards and jaguars, the Mayas called the Aztecs curly or frizzy hair here we go which is characteristic of sub-saharan africans well the indigenous also landed in south america as well don't forget that yes that is true furthermore one can find black negro african people in the mexican codices including the codex teleriano and codex mendoza Connecting the dots. In summary, it would appear that the character named Gavite in the Dance of the Giants represents the Spanish. The blacks defeating, defeated by Gavite were the Aztecs, who were identified by the Maya, and Spanish as black were represented in the codices as a horrible people who mistreated the other local tribes. The whites who landed in Chichen Itza were Vikings. The Vikings were well-known navigators that sailed to many nations in Europe, including Great Britain. They may have been sailing in the Atlantic and were mislaid by a storm until they reached Mexico. As Dennis Tedlock notes in Popol Vuh, the Mayan book of the dawn of life, they didn't know where they were going. They did this for a long time. When they were... There in the grasslands, the black people, the white people, people of many faces, people of many languages, 
uncertain there at the edge of the sky. This mention of whites and blacks in the Popolva supports the diverse populations depicted in the Chichen Itza murals. Okay. Sorry, man. I just need to keep scrolling. That's it. No, we we're done. Again. Yeah, no, we're done. I've got to make sure we're done. We're done. That was a very long article, and <sighs> you did really well. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Tap your it. Yeah. No, fair enough, too. Uh, look, a couple of things there. Could be a much older story, maybe. Because, um, I mean, don't forget that the LIDAR and all that sort of stuff, they estimate that at one time there was over 100 million people that populated the South American peninsula there, right? So that's 110 million people, various people, various languages, right? Um, and I don't know whether or not, yeah, that's the first time I'd ever heard of the Aztec being black. Have you ever heard of that before? No, it was. It's not something that's ever came up. No, to be honest, I never really thought about it. No, I just uh, thought that would have been that uh, Indian, you know, yeah, American yeah, Indian yeah. type type. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would have, but I guess being up more so from Mexico, you're on the uh, equator. Yeah, that's true. So, yeah, I guess it's highly possible. Mm. Interesting, though. Look, I, I don't. A very large article with a lot of, yeah, yeah, it was a lot of story. Uh, I don't know. So, we'll let it go, mate. We transfer now over onto the EFS realm. EFS. And last time we were talking EFS, we were talking about hominids. Hominids, we? yeah, yeah. And I think evolution. I think uh, old Max was unpacking evolution. I and I think, uh, well, yeah, evolution and like our the- our creation story, mm. like. Yeah, where we came from. And I guess that's what where the title of the next chapter leads us to with door number three. It's this is the next option mm. of how we came into existence. Because, mm. yeah, well, I'll, yeah, door number three, you're right. So I'll read the last sentence because then about 35,000 years ago, modern man suddenly arrived on a scene. Where did he come from so quickly? How is it possible? Put quite simply, it's not, not without help. Alluding to what door number three could possibly be. It must be difficult to be a scientist who is forced to remain within set parameters while knowing full well that within these parameters, a surprising number of species that exist on Earth, including man, quite simply have no business actually being here at all. In order to help deal with this dilemma, when new theories are presented within academia, the new information is assessed, discussed, criticised, moulded, remoulded, and even remoulded yet again if necessary, until the new data can be fitted comfortably into the current paradigm in any particular field, be it archaeology, paleontology, biology, biology, whatever. As we have previously discussed, this process is necessary in order to make the information conform as closely as possible to every leading and obviously concerned scientist's current way of thinking. To present a theory in any other way within academia is simply inviting immediate rejection under a barrage of scathing criticism. This authoritarian system of excruciating peer review has always been an effective way of keeping independent thinkers among the orthodox science community out of the public information loop. It's interesting. What do we say? 06 this was written? Oh, six. Yeah, that oh, was the, that was the. I think that's what yes, we found out. Yes, yeah, yes, yes. it's fascinating how much information is more disseminated now with YouTube and stuff like that. Okay, like mm. when he goes on like that, I can see what he's saying, and it still probably does exist in academia. But for the general public, we have access yep. to so much more information in the last. 18 years, yeah. or, you know, or six, yeah, 18 years, 16 years, whatever. Uh, well, once upon a time, 2006 is pre-iPhone. Mm. So you weren't carrying your computer with you all the time. There was laptops, but that's you interesting perception. You 2006 is pre-iPhone. You couldn't just have a smoke and pull your phone out and read an article. Yeah. Read a scientific document while you're sitting on the dunny. Basically. Exactly. You weren't carrying your computer with you 24 mm. seven, whereas now we are. Mm. So that's, that's a massive difference in the dissemination of information. Yeah. Yeah. 
however, in spite of this vast information filtering system that is in place, it is becoming increasingly clear that Darwin's theory will soon become as obsolete as the notion that the Earth is flat, which <laughs> refer for the Patreon listeners, and the stars resolve, revolve around us despite the constant attempts by academia to keep the f- flailing theory's nose above the fast-rising waters of con- contrary evidence. Author Lloyd High wrote an extremely informative and well-researched book on this topic that I highly recommend entitled Human Origins. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. We should put that on the list. Uh, Where he aptly demonstrates the enormous difference between primates and humans. Naturally, the work receives some scathing criticism from the science community despite this meticulous research and abundant evidence. Such constant attacks are becoming tiresome these days, but can also be useful in some ways because knowing how intent academia at large is in suppressing information, usually find that such criticism from them a good reason to read. What is more often than not a highly informative paper. Yeah, and the, you could you could lay that. I mean, we just experienced that, right? I mean, when you see a uh, a wrong information or when the fact checkers check a post, that doesn't make you go, oh, it must be wrong. No. It makes you go, why do you have to tell me this? Look, Facebook told me that Marcus Aurelius was wrong a little yeah. while ago. What didn't exist. No, he didn't. He didn't quote. I made a meme up and yeah, he didn't oh, say what right. he said apparently. Of course. Hmm. And yeah, one of the boys went, did Facebook just call Marcus Aurelius a liar? Yeah. Uh, and much there and not where are we otherwise it wouldn't have been ruffled or otherwise it wouldn't have ruffled so many academic feathers but the fact that there are fatal flaws in darwin's theory is now evident and much to their annoyance it has ever been scientifically proven by academia itself due to recent quite major advancements that have been made in various fields such as the discovery mapping and study of dna again how much how much has that come along in the last 15 plus years right mm. uh just before you go on i was just thinking about it right got a I, I i was and i was thinking about the motivations of darwin and his peers so they were it was it was kind of like a race that i could i could only compare to maybe like the space race mm. okay the cold war space race so they're in a they're in a race or a battle against the church and they're trying to find a argument as yeah. to how we could possibly have come how into science, being yeah science proving exactly yeah. the the link through to where we came from mm-hmm. against creationism because mm-hmm. it's evolution versus creation mm. so when you're when you're you have the pressure of competition upon you you may when you find a solution that might not be perfect but it's good it ticks enough the boxes yeah we'll push it yeah it's like has anyone got anything better no this is it this is it this Everyone, is the one you're on board on mate. board let's go yeah this is how we're going to finally win this battle ring Jono. ring robo this is this this is the one exactly yeah yeah you're right uh, the information is also quite well known within science community itself, though they just seem to make a point not to actually inform the public. The information emerged as yet another somewhat rude shock for science about 1980 and further confounded the de- devotees of Darwinian thinking. You see, paleontologists, through the study of bones, had discovered that at, if it actually happened, the split in the evolutionary chain when primates evolved to man must have occurred sometime between 5 and 8 million years ago. That's an interesting number. Then armed with this information, a group of geneticists in 1980 decided to attempt to narrow that date down to discover a more accurate timeline. The geneticists believed that this wide bracket of 3 million years could be narrowed dramatically by charting mutations in DNA, and so they began gathering gathering DNA samples from around the world to use in their subsequent experiments. A controversy then erupted when the results for these tests came in and the information would seem so shocking that the tests would run again, in fact, several times. 
over because what they showed was that genetically man was in fact no more than 200,000 years old. Naturally, the roar of protest from anthropologists was unprecedented. <laughs> what does a roar of an anthropologist sound like? How I, don't we, I don't know. However, subsequent twisting has now proved that beyond any doubt that the geneticists were absolutely correct. And there are other things too. Lloyd Pye discover, covers these topics quite extensively in Human Origins. And again, I highly recommend reading it. For example, a popular st statistic that is presented to us to back up evolution is the fact that DNA of humans differs from chimpanzees' DNA as by as little as 1% and from gorillas by only 2%. This makes it appear to those that are uneducated in the science of genetics that evolution is quite obviously correct and humans and primates are virtually cousins. However, what they never seem to mention is that the human DNA tree has 3 billion base pairs, so if 1% is this, it's in fact 30 million base pairs. Now, 30 million base pairs is, in reality, a tremendous amount of difference between the two species by any measure. Of course, with gorillas, that would be 60 million base pairs. When we talk about the DNA, the junk DNA, the fact that stuff can be stored on DNA now, like there's terabytes of data that can be stored on the strings, and we don't have any idea what is our DNA does, like the brain. You know what I mean? We don't know. We're only scratching the surface. Not even, I don't think. Yeah. Primates also suffer from very few genetic co from very few genetic disorders, apart from perhaps albinism which is a gene common in a variety of animals, variety of animal groups, including humans. By way of comparison, humans have over 4,000 genetic disorders, several that will most definitely kill absolutely every victim. So we asked to believe that these disorders manifested in our evolution to a higher and more improved species. That's a fair point. One of the most undeniable, obvious difference of all between the species can also be found in the fact that primates have 48 chromosomes, yet humans, who are considered to be vastly superior to them in the evolutionary chain, only have 46. So how in I the would, world... I would just like to stop him there with his way of comparing these things. Mm. When, he's, when he's saying vastly superior, mm. it's only in mental capacity. It's only cognitive ability. That's not the in, only difference. Not in yeah. physical not traits. Not in physical traits. No. no. Chimpanzee and, will rip your head off, you know what I mean? And if you compare a race car to a standard car, mm. you would claim it to be vastly superior. In all aspects. No, no. Well, not in comfort or anything. Well, but true. you would still true. say a race car is, is better, superior. is a superior car to a to a standard road car. Mm. But it's also a lot they're usually a lot simpler because mm. they've got to be lighter. Mm. So they don't have all the technological stuff that we consider luxury, mm. that's removed. Mm. There's your two chromosomes. You pull them out because you don't need them. You want a, you want a more a sharpened vessel mm. sort of thing. Mm. So I just, I just, I feel like he's taking uh, liberty to steer the audience there. It, it, it's a biased set of comments. Like that comparison is biased. I like like the fact that we have more genetic disorders. Mm. That that also kind of correlates over to the race car. Like a mm. race car breaks down a lot, exactly. a lot more than what a, a standard road car does, mm. sort of thing. So it has more disorders, yeah, because it's fragile. <laughs> it's more fragilely built, <laughs> and it's simpler because yeah. it doesn't have the luxuries built in. Yeah, but you know? we. Yeah, I mean the the reality is, and I, and I've I've said this in my teaching a lot. It's like Every, everybody understands the only reason that we are the dominant species on this planet is because we can do what we're doing right now. Yeah. We can communicate. Language. That's right. We can interpret and we well, can it's use a lot of, it's dexterity. A lot of, that's right. It's a, lot, it's a few factors combined mm. in terms of, yes, the, the language, the ability to manipulate things with our hands mm. and the mental capacity to create tools. Mm. That's really only what separates, like, because we're not real fast. You think of the we're mental capacity squishy. of, you know what of I mean? an orca; mm. it's pretty high. Mm -hmm. Like they're they're meant to be very intelligent mm -hmm. beings, but they have flippers. They don't have hands, so the the amount of coincidences don't line up to be able for them to be able to rule the world. Mm. Like they are the apex predator that basically is not yeah. preyed upon. That's right. So they rule their section of the 
of the world, mm. but in a different way to what in we do. Way. And they can't not technologically advanced. Mm. Or so we think. Maybe mm. maybe that's who's flying the UFOs. Maybe it coming is, from man. under the ocean. Maybe it's it fucking is, dude. Orcas, maybe, maybe it is, dude. Look, that's as good as theory as any. <laughs> anyway, uh, we, we digress. Okay, where are we? So how in the world could we just lose two full chromosomes in this evolutionary improvement process we are supposed to have undergone? Two full chromosomes is an awful lot of DNA just to disappear. Primates are also much stronger than humans. In fact, pound for pound ratio, about five to ten times, even small monkeys. Yeah, that's true. If we really evolve from primates, then apart from losing chromosomes, how does we also become puny and weak compared to our ancestors in this improvement process? Look, if it was an... Im- yeah, I mean, well... Yeah, <laughs> you know, I just thought about... Maybe it was the, with the first incarnation we were giants that's right so we're going to turn gorillas into superhumans so we were tall we were strong and we had all the capacity that we have now maybe more mm. well well that's yeah. one of the that's one of the rabbit holes out mm. there mm. that does a comparison that there's a there's a line of theory line of thinking out there where it's like dinosaurs used to be huge mm. so were the um megafauna mm-hmm. like before us mm-hmm. No, a giant wombats were here not that long ago. That's right. So they claim that that this was caused by an increase uh, in oxygen and air pressure. Yeah, is what made like things yeah. massive. Yeah. So oxygen was at twenty five or twenty seven percent. It's a temperature thing too. Like CO two was higher, so the plants grew bigger and all that That's sort of it. stuff. Everything as well. was going yeah. nuts. Yeah. It was like at a more prime time. This is the theory. Mm. Um. So everything was bigger. Everything mm. was more abundant. Um, so that's, that's like a fun rabbit hole to go down in terms of like, to explain like the, we are like the kangaroo is now, I guess, Mm. in a way is what you could explain. Mm. There used to be a much bigger, better version of a kangaroo of it, but then they died out because the, the atmosphere and that changed. Mm. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's, it's interesting, but I like where he's going. When analysed, nothing about evolution makes any logical sense at all, really. The list goes on. Human bones are far lighter than primate bones, or Neanderthal, or any other so-called ancestral species, and more. It was explained well in a recent article by Lloyd Pye, in which he made the following observations. Skin. Human skin is not well adapted to the amount of sunlight striking Earth, and can be modified to survive extended exposure by greatly increasing melanin, its dark pigment, at its surface, which only the Negro and Aborigine races have achieved. All others must cover themselves with clothing or frequent shade or both, or sicken from radiation poisoning. Body hair. Primates not need worry about the direct exposure to sunlight because they are covered in head to toe in a distinctive pattern of long body hair. Because they are quadrupeds, move on all fours, the thickest hair is on their back, the thinnest on their chest and abdomen. The humans have lost the all-over pelt, well, not all of us, uh, and we have, look, I'm hairy dude, man. Like, a, I'm, I'm yeah. but I bet you're hairier on your chest than what you are on your back, exactly. Which that's, is the opposite, yeah. That's the weird one that they're mm. talking about. Mm. But in amongst all this, too, I just want to remind everyone that we didn't evolve from the gorillas and the chimpanzees that we're currently talking about. No, no, they evolved at the same time as us. If we're gonna just to jump on the evolution side, yeah, for yeah. a second. It's a side by side thing. It's a side by side. We yeah. came from a common ancestor mm. and we split from them, sort of thing. So they everything that they possess now mm. is not they didn't necessarily have it back when they split. Is right. It, yeah. So they've developed to fit a niche now. Mm. So their niche is not our niche. No. Hence why we don't have what they have. Mm. We chose to leave the jungle and and go out onto the um in, again I'm, I'm banging on down the evolutionary line here mm. but i'm saying so we came down out of the trees and we went out into the plains mm. and this Ate is mushrooms and saw god well you're not on that no i'm i'm trying to stay on the evolutionary okay, sorry, thing right sorry. now i'm just trying to talk that one <laughs> there's too many theories we mm. can't throw them all in the same spot I know, I know. but yes stoned ape is a is a section where we could go mm. but if we stick to the paradigm and then we develop tools so because mm. we're a bipedal so we've got very good endurance and we can run things down mm. and then we develop tools to be able to fight off predators and to make hunting easier and all of those mm. kinds of things mm. 
so we didn't have to run as far. Now we can cut things up, and then from there we continue to go down the line, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? And and we're now, and here we are. We're and now awesome. here we are. Mm. So we can't. Some of the comparison not, between us yeah. chimpanzees and gorillas is not can valid. get thrown out of proportion mm. because they lived in a different part of the environment, so they look different. Mm -hmm. So they didn't evolve to fill our niche. Mm -hmm. That's why we're not directly competing with one another because mm -hmm. they're different niches. Mm -hmm. I, I, while you were talking, I was thinking that, um, cause it was a little while ago, they said that they were observing, I think it was chimps, chimps yeah. uh, that they, they'd reached the stone, stone age, age, right? Because they were creating tools. They're creating tools, yeah. but then they realized that they were just observing, the chimps were observing the crews that were watching them yeah and using what they were doing yeah using their environment to try because and... you got to think if you've got like a boom mic yeah chimps are seeing this other thing with hands mm. hold a stick yeah and they're like i got sticks yeah what can what's i this? use yeah, sticks what's this? for yeah yeah i can get worms out of, out right. of branches mm. with a with a smaller stick mm. You can you can definitely explain so, yeah, I, away I think, that transition. I, yeah, I think it was they they said that it might not have been that. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, yeah. Continue. And we have completely switched our area of thickness to the chest and abdomen while wearing the thin part on our back. Fat humans have ten times as many fat cells attached to the underside of their skin as primates. If a primate is wounded by a gash or tear in the skin, when the bleeding stops, the wound's edges lie flat near each other and can quickly close the wound by a process called contracture. Contracture. He, contracture. Oh, yeah, good. Uh, well, you'll you get all the difficult words tonight, mate. Yeah, mate, I'm warmed up. You're warmed up. Your tongue's, your tongue's all over <laughs> the I've failed a lot already. Yeah. <laughs> In humans, the fat layer is so thick that it pushes up through the wound and makes contracture difficult, if not impossible. Also, contrary to the propaganda to try and explain this oddity, the fat under the human skin does not compensate for the body hair we have lost. Only in water is its insulating capacity useful. In air, it is minimal at best. Head hair. All primates have head hair that grows to a certain length and then stops. Humans' head hair grows to such lengths that could be dangerous in a primitive situation. Thus, we have been forced to cut our head hair since we have become a species which may account for some of the sharp flakes of stones that are considered primitive hominid tools. Man, look, this is a... Uh, We'll keep going. However, this is a a um a rabbit hole. I, I it, follow it, these guys on Facebook, right? Yeah, and yeah. they've got these like these stones, and yeah. they're like, "Here's a multifaceted stone with a carved head and a you know a jaguar skull." It's just a stone, dude. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. I don't see. Mm -hmm. Like this is a flint edge carved from the Stone Age. Yeah, well, I can take you down the river, and we can find a thousand of those if you like. Yeah. Some of them, yeah, yes, but a lot of this, a lot of that stuff, it's man, a, that I it's see, very is, long it's bow. a very long bow, man, very yeah. long bow. Uh, where are we? Fingernails and toenails. All primates have fingernails and toenails that grow to a certain length and stop, never needing pairing. Human fingernails and toenails have always needed pairing. Again, maybe those stone tools were not only for butchering, butchering animals. Skull. The human skull is nothing like the primate skull. There is hardly any fair morphological comparison to be made apart from the general parts being the same. The design and assembly are so radically different as to make attempts at comparison useless. Brains. The comparison here is even more radical because human brains are so vastly different. To say improved or superior is unfair and not germane because primate brains work perfectly well for what primates have to do to live and reproduce. Locomotion. Can you feel the locomotion? It's an early Kylie coming to my head. The comparison here is easily as wide as the comparison of brains and skulls. Humans are bipedal, primates are quadrupeds. That says more than enough. Speech. Human throats are completely redesigned relative to primate throats. The larynx has dropped to a much lower position so humans can break typical primate sounds into the tiny pieces of sound by modulation that have come to be human speech. Sex. Primate females have osteous cycles and are sexually receptive only at special times. Human females have no osteous cycle in the primate sense and are continually receptive to sex. Ooh, I'd debate I'd that. Debate. 
<laughs> so uh, I think every I think both the, the the ladies and the men out there who were listening just laughed out loud. Like, sorry if you spat your coffee out because that's anyway. In regard to the origin of man, there has only ever been a choice between door number one and door number two. Recently, door number three has been unveiled. But even though both creationists and Darwinists have strong teams of supporters, the vast amount of overwhelming evidence against both the theories can no longer be ignored. It's no good trying to surround the issue with an air of the emperor's new clothes syndrome because it just can't work forever. Maybe it's because academia deems the world at large is not ready for the real information. Whatever is behind the motivation, the truth cannot be suppressed forever. In a stroke of bad luck for both sides of the orthodox coin, and also at this stage the evidence for creation, outside intervention lies behind door number three. It far outweighs the evidence of creation by any other means. It's a time, mate. Do we put the we didn't put the rocket clock on, did we? Or it's uh, only been an hour with that whole with the big dog in there or the big the interview. Article. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So but do it... you want to do a little bit more? Uh, let's have a look. Wings in the... Let's just see where we're going. Give me a read of EFS. I haven't had a read of EFS yet. Oh, dude, this is going on and on and on. We've got dinosaurs. We've got all sorts of stuff going on here. Well, maybe we won't get to a new chapter, but give me a go. Yeah, that's cool. And then we'll, we'll, then we'll call it quitsies. Yeah, well, if I've you only wanted... got a few minutes left in me anyway. No, that's what I thought. I, now I've got a lost where we are. Wings in the night. Wings so there's wings in the night... And then, yeah, maybe I'll do a little bit after. Or if you've got like a few minutes in, you'll we'll see how we go. Over. There was wings in the wings night. Wings in go. the night. All right. <clears throat> Apart from the fact that it's extremely doubtful, if not impossible, that we ever evolved from primates, have you ever considered the very real possibility that the entire time frame we have been given for the events that have occurred on the Earth may in fact be completely wrong. Yes, we have, Max. For example, there is significant, significant evidence suggesting that the dinosaurs may not have actually died out 65 million years ago at all, but may have in fact survived until much more recently. As ridiculous as the idea may seem to you at first, incredible, incredibly, evidence suggests that the theory is not without substance and should not be too lightly dismissed without first receiving some serious consideration. A considerable amount of unusual and strangely persistent legends abound concerning strange flying beasts, for example. Yeah, dragons. There are quite literally hundreds of such reports, many of them from some quite populated parts of the world and from very respectable people. There are also strange rock carvings and paintings around the world, as well as artifacts that depict such creatures. One quite fascinating story destro- describes such a winged creature appearing in an interesting book by a British anthropologist called Frank H. Mellard, entitled In Which Bound Africa, first published in 1923. I mean, they talk about big things. Mm. Big birds existed to very recently. Yes. Like, we hunted them. The mower in mm. New Zealand. Mm. The, what was it? What eagle was that? The the eagle in mm. New Zealand. Mm. They had some two very big birds. Like 12 foot wingspan or some ridiculous. It was massive. Yeah. It was big enough to pick up a small child. Mm. Sort of thing. So it quite well could have preyed on mm. small children. Mm. Frank Mellard was the chief magistrate for the Kasempa district in northern Rhodesia from 1911 until 1922, and also a respected scholar and explorer. In one section of his book, he describes a tribe of natives known as the Kaondi, who live in the Jayundu swamps in northwest Zambia, reporting that the tribe lived in fear of a terrifying winged monster that inhabited the depths of a nearby section of swamp. The natives called the beast a congomado, which means the overwhelmer of boats, and they described the creature as not being so much like a bird, but rather more like a huge lizard with large membranous wings that spanned around four to seven feet. 
similar looking to those of a bat. They say it was so... They say it has no plumage and leathery skin, reddish in colour. The natives told Mellard that they believed it was it has a beak that also contained teeth, but readily admitted that no one had actually seen it close enough to be really sure and live to tell any tales about it. Mellard tried to convince them of the convince any of the natives to take him to the swamp where the Congomado was located, but could not get one of them to take him there for any money or prize. That's fair enough. That's fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. We know it's there. We know it's there. I'm not going yeah. there. We don't go and poke the dragon, don't dude. Poke the dragon. Don't poke the dragon. You don't want to see the dragon. <laughs> he firmly believed that the natives were quite genuinely terrified of the area in which it was said to live, particularly after nightfall. Excuse me. You're right, mate. Eventually, he obtained some books that contained pictures of some pterodactyls to show the tribe and claims that every single native unhesitatingly pointed at the picture and nodded, firmly stating that this was their Congomado. Mellard, Mellard said that his part, for his part in the tale, he believed the natives. He wrote that he was convinced the creature had somehow survived the passage of time at least until recently, adding that the swamps of northern Zambia would ne- would indeed make ideal habitat for such a creature. There are a number of other explorers who have lent corroboration to Mallard's strange tale of flying beasts from Zambia too. Quite an interesting comment is made by A. a. Blaney Percival in a similar book to that of Mallard's, Mallard's entitled a game warden on safari that was published in 1928. When writing of a conversation he had with some local natives in Kenya, Blaney remarks, the Katui Wakamba tell of a huge flying beast which comes down from Mount Kenya by night. They only see it against the sky, but they have seen its tracks more than they have shown these to a white man who told me about them saying he could make nothing of the spore, which portrayed the two feet and an apparently heavy tail. Wow. Now, let's just think for a moment about, you know, how, I mean, as as humans, we've made a lot of things go extinct. Yeah. So let's just think about the way the, the population declines. Mm-hmm. And there's usually pockets mm-hmm. that are left. Mm-hmm. So maybe there was, because we're on a big globe. Absolutely. And if you happen to be at the right place at the right time, you Absolutely. may, in amongst all these nuclear winters and and the fact that they can fly, mm. so they can fly to a better place. Mm-hmm. Just like the migrating birds of, of today that exist yeah, right now. Absolutely. So you can get away from where it's shit. Mm. You can get to a nice little, um, nice zone and, 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 live su- there for a and survive. Yeah. Sort of thing. So it's not, look, there's no reason. As we've said here before, you know, we live down under, so we understand how big this country is and we totally understand that there's no man alive and probably no man ever that's worked every single square inch of this country, right? Mm. Times that by the globe. Like there's, you know. Exactly. Especially in Africa. In Africa, in the Alps, in Europe as well. Like, you know, the massive mountain ranges all up and through Europe because that's where they, they reckon they still see the spore of dragons you know mm-hmm. what i mean like mm-hmm. that's yeah that's some, yeah 100 percent. Mm. and another tale containing a striking number of similarities to mallard's story were also recounted in a game warden takes stock by colonel crs Pittman, published in 1942 when in northern rhodesia i heard of a mythical beast which intrigued me considerably it was said to haunt formerly, and perhaps still to haunt, a dense swampy forest region in the neighbourhood of the Angola and Congo borders. To look upon it is death, but the most amazing feature of this mystery beast is its suggested identity with a creature bat-bird-like in form on a gigantic scale. 
strangely reminiscent of the prehistoric pterodactyl. From whence does the primitive African derive such a fanciful idea? Well, because they saw it. They just saw it. Why is that so difficult for people to grasp, right? When there's these weird pictures on the walls of these weird things. Because they drew it because because they saw it. Before our time, like our, our parents and our grandparents, they were just uneducated workers. And we are asking the questions now and we are asking, but what about an anomaly? Mm. Like, yes, we understand you have your theory, Mm. but what if there was an anomaly Mm. that meant it wasn't, it wasn't just purely black and white, Mm. you know, did everything die out 65 million years ago? No, because crocodiles are everything. Sharks are still here. Exactly. Brown snakes and versions of snakes are still here. Exactly. So why couldn't other things mm. that filled a niche mm-hmm. that didn't need to change? Mm. If you're just cruising the jungles and the mountaintops and just, you know, eating birds and that food's never going to run out yeah. as long as it stays temperate. Like you said, good spot's a good spot, right? Yeah. You've got wings, you can fly to another good spot. Exactly. Munch on what's around. Yeah. Evolve as you need to evolve. Yeah. But you only need to evolve if there is need, pressures. Yeah, pressures, external to pressures. To yeah, evolve. Right. Yeah, yeah. So if there isn't, if yeah. you are like an orca, if you are the apex predator of your niche, mm. then there's no need to evolve. If there's enough food to keep you, to sustain you and the right environmental conditions that make your size and other things not a problem, mm. then you can continue to exist. Yeah. As long as you can procreate. Yeah. That's that's the only thing you and need. And not be killed. Yeah. Is to, to survive and breed. Hmm. Again, in a later book entitled Old Forelegs, the story of the coelacanth, published in 1956, J.L.B. Smith and a South African professor writes, the descendants of a missionary who had lived near Mount Kilimanjaro wrote from Germany, giving a good deal of information about flying dragons they go. believed to still live in those parts. The family had apparently heard of them from the natives and one man actually seen such a creature at night. I did not and do not dispute at least the possibility that some such creature may still exist. Mm-hmm. In a book entitled Searching for Hidden Animals by Royal Roy Mackle, there is a report about one of the zoologists who was on the team examining the coelacanth called Dr. Courtney Latimer, who also investigated the sighting of a large flying lizard in Namibia. Apparently a boy resting under a tree was awoken by the crashing sound of a huge reptilian looking beast rushing down from a mountain slope behind him. The boy tells of sheep scattering in all directions to escape the creature which landed on the ground in a huge cloud of dust. The boy says the creature made a dreadful amount of noise and gave off an odour similar to burned brass and he passed out from the fright of the incident. The police were called and the incident investigated by them and by local farmers. You're right, mate. Some of whom actually said they had seen the creature and witnessed it slip into a crevice in the mountainside. The police then gathered some dynamite and set a charge in the crevice in the hope of killing or sealing the beast inside. After the charge was detonated, several members of the party reported to have heard a low moaning coming from the rubble for a short period and then silence. Wow, where's the? And I would be most interested to know where the crevice. Where's where the crevice? is that crevice? Dig, yeah, dig it out. I What's would be most there? interested to know where the location of the actual crevice is in Namibia to see if anyone has attempted to clear away the rubble from the blast by now to see what may actually lie buried beneath. Africa is not the only place where similar sightings have been reported. There was even a news report that appeared in the Illustrated London News way back in February the 9th, 1856. Give me a little bit more. Next one. Okay. Next time I'll do that. 
where was I? In 1856, concerning an utterly amazing event that reportedly occurred in France. The tale was recounted in concerning an was recounted in concerning an utterly amazing event that reportedly occurred. Oh my God, I missed the line. Recounted in lost cities of North and Central America <laughs> by David Hatcher Childress, in which he describes the story of a tunnel being cut to unite St. Dizier and Nancy Railways in France from the Press Greyloose News Service which describe how when a rock was blasted open, a creature exactly like a pterodactyl with a wig span of about 10 feet and livid black emerged from the, from the rock, walking with the aid of its wings, emerged in, into light and expired after uttering a hoarse cry. Naturalists reportedly identified the creature as a pterodactyl and the rock strata as being millions of years old. That one just got pushed to the back of the filing cabinet, didn't it? No? Yeah. Yeah. Sent the, we just saw a, a, a pterodactyl just died in front of us <laughs> in a tunnel. No. No. no and we forgot about it. Even America has its fair share of similar tales. As a point of interest, the largest pteranodon skeleton ever found was retrieved in fossil form from Big Bend National Park in North, in North America. The creature sported a wingspan of an impressive 51 feet, making it the largest flying reptile like remains ever found. 15 plus meters, man. 15 plus meters for a pterodon. Yeah. Amazing, isn't it? They were, they were massive. Mm. A number of pterodon remains have been retrieved from the Big Bend area. So we know they inhabited the area once. And another interesting fact is that almost every Indian tribe in continental America, both north and south, all have tribal legends of flying monsters, according to Hatcher Childress in Lost Cities. There are many there are many have stories of a gigantic flying monster so large that it darkened the sun. I didn't yawn. I know, I'm just I'm just ah. No, don't. Okay. I told you when. <laughs> you did. Your well, otherwise you, you go. distract me. Otherwise you distract me and then this happens. You see your hand out here like this going. Here, here, here. I'm like, no. Okay. I said, where are you on? Okay. There are okay. many have stories of a gigantic fly. It's, it was his bloody error that. Yeah, I know. That uh, yeah, I know. tripped me up. I know. A gigantic flying monster so large that it darkened the sun. The Hayden na- natives of Queen Charlotte Islands in British Columbia believe that some Thunderbirds were so yes. huge that they could literally pick up small whales from the sea. Much of their art and wood carving depicts su- such a capture by a Thunderbird. Some South American Indians believe that the bird was constantly at war with the powers living beneath the sea, particularly a horned serpent that it tore up and that it tore up large trees in search of giant grubs, which were its favorite food. The clapping of these giants' wings created thunder, so they were known as Thunderbirds. Mm. David Hatcher Childress also says in his book, Lost Cities of the Americas, that a carving of one of these birds can be seen on the bluff face at Mississippi near Alto, Illinois. There was an intriguing tale by John Keel appeared in the March 1991 edition of Fate magazine. The incident was first reported in the Tombstone, Arizona epitaph in April of 1880. And I will let Triff take it from here. Thanks, mate. The story of the two prospects. This is interesting stuff, eh? It is, This is interesting stuff. All right, it's getting late though, isn't it? We will we'll wrap it up in the near future. Yeah, we're just about at an hour and a half now, so yeah, go for as long as you feel, mate, and then then we'll wrap it up. The story goes that two prospectors returning to Tombstone actually shot and killed either a pterodactyl or a pterodon, even retrieving the carcass and returning it in return and re- the bloody hell, returning with it to the. <laughs> <laughs> And returning with it to the town. 
Keel reports that the beast was nailed to a barn wall and a photograph taken with six prospectors standing beneath it with their arms outstretched and fingers touching. The creature is said to have a wingspan of about 36 feet. Keel also claims to have seen the photograph himself and says that at least 20 people who claim to have also seen it have written to him about it, but unfortunately no one seems to know where it may be located now. In the Smithsonian. Yeah, so where the, if he saw the photo, where is it? It's in the Smithsonian. It's in the, it's in the filing With cabinet. all the fucking giants. That's right, well. exactly, I know. Apparently there were two photographs at a place called Hammersley Fork, one of which is said to have burnt in a house fire. They always burn in a house fire. Where, while the other was reported to have been taken away by strangers from the Smithsonian. They didn't say that. It is debatable whether this event actually occurred or whether the photograph actually exists, but it is an intriguing tale nonetheless. I've searched high and low for a copy of the photograph and have yet had, have had no luck as yet, but I'll keep you posted. However, not all sightings of flying creatures are from events that were reported so long ago. In fact, there were some very unusual instances that have happened quite recently. Do you want to uh, sort two of those out? Yeah. yeah. Uh, got two coming. You got two coming? Special ones? Uh, as documented by Hatcher Childress in Lost Cities, there was an extremely bizarre series of events involving a number of different people that occurred in 1975 and 1976 in the town of Raymondville, Texas. Firstly, on December 24th, Christmas Eve, in 1975, a man by the name of Joe Suarez woke up to find his tethered goat had been ripped to shreds and partially devoured. Yet, strangely, no tracks could be found that led either to or from the carcass. What had killed the animal was a total mystery to the man. Local police were called, but could also find no trace of tracks or footprints to identify the unknown assailant. Then, 21 days later, at 10.30 in the evening on January 4, 1970, January 14th, 1976, and in the same town, a young man called Armando Grimaldo was sitting with his mother in their backyard when he suddenly attacked by, viciously by a strange winged creature. Armando apparently told the Raymondsville press that as he walked around to the far side of the house, he felt something with big claws grab him from behind and that he looked back to see what it was. Then he began running for his life, claiming to be the most scared he has ever been. Armando kept running to reach the cover of his mother's house, stumbling and sprawling as the beast kept clutching his clothes, trying to get a hold of him as he ran. Unable to reach the house, he was forced to dive under a low bush to escape the creature. His clothes now but all torn to shreds, the beast hovered about the bush a little and then flew off panting as if tired from the exertion. Eventually the boy collapsed through the door of his mother's house and onto the floor, his clothes torn and bloodied muttering bird over and over again in Spanish. He was taken to hospital and treated for minor wounds and shock before being later released. Armando Grimaldo describes his attacker as being about six feet tall brackish brown leathery skin, a wingspan of about 10 to 12 feet, and large red eyes. Oof. That'd be scary, man. Like, you'd, you'd feel something scratching your back and turn around and see a dinosaur trying to pick you up. And, and I mean, and what do we, we say? Child, right? So, yeah. small enough to try and nab. Yeah, so I want to know what his wounds were like. Mm, were they scratches? How the hell did he get away? Yeah. Like, were we've they... all seen what, like, an eagle's feet's like. Mm. So I'm only assuming well, that they would be similar. Similar, you would think. Doing a similar There's some thing. sort of clause, yeah. A short time later, on that very same night, on the outskirts of the nearby, ta- nearby town of Brownsville, which is also on the Rio Grande, a creature exactly, oh, where are we? A creature exactly matching that description crashed into the side of a mobile home owned by Mr. Alverico Guajardo. He quickly went outside to investigate the incident and noticed a large creature of some kind on the ground next to his wall. So he got inside the station wagon and flicked his headlights on for a better look. Gujardo described what he saw as looking like a creature from hell. The beast was apparently startled by the lights because according to Gujardo, as soon as the headlights struck the creature, it rose up from the ground, turning to glare at him with huge red eyes and began making a horrible sounding noise in its throat. He reports that the creature then continued regarding him menacingly for two or three minutes with its wings drawn up, wrapped around its shoulders, before slowly backing out of the light and disappearing into the night. He said that the beast was truly terrifying, and at the time he was almost paralysed with fear at the sight of it. 
could be a genetic memory thing too. You know what I mean? Like it could be a genetic memory thing there. Eh? In January 1976, another bizarre incident was reported by two sisters named Deanie and Libby Ford who saw what they described as a huge and strange big black bird at a pond just outside Brownsville, Texas. The sisters say that the creature was as tall as they were and had a face like a bat. When they were later shown a book containing pictures of prehistoric animals, both sisters identified the creature that they had seen as a pterodon. Well, we were nearly there. The next month, on February 26, 1976, the San Antonio Light reported that two days previous, on the 24th, three local school teachers had seen an enormous black bird while driving to work. So, I mean, have they disturbed a nest or something like that? You know what I mean? Because um, what's the other part of the story, right? These, these things live underground, okay? And if you are smart enough to survive millions of years, you're going to have a good underground cave, aren't you, right? Yes. So Where we live underground. That's well, right. I mean, where do we think we may have, may have lived? That's right. Underground. Underground, right? So, yeah, these these dragons, and we go blasting tunnels and stuff, and we, we disturb these these creatures, you know. Uh, the three said the creature had leathery wings in a span of about 15 to 20 feet. They observed it swooping in low over several cars, commenting that it did so, it appeared to have glided more than fly. The three say that it was large enough at times and at times low enough for its shadow to cover the entire road. Another similar creature was also seen at the same time by the group, only further off in the distance that seemed to be circling a herd of cattle. wonder where, how far away Skywalker is from here, a skinwalker. Uh, upon their arrival at the school where they worked, the group immediately began looking through encyclopedias for the creature and also identified the beast they observed as a pterodon. Then yet another event occurred on September 14th, 1982, when at 3.55am in the morning, a Mr. James Thompson, who was an ambulance technician from Harlington, saw what appeared to be a huge bird-like object fly over Highway 100 at a height of around 150 feet. Thompson says that at first he thought it was a large model plane expected it to land on the road until it noticed it flap its wings. In the night sky, the creature seemed to have a black or greyish colour and looked to be covered with hide rather than plumage. These are just some of the sightings that have been reported. There have been quite a number of of other sightings of similar creatures in many other places around the world as well. Places as diverse as Africa, North and South America, Sumatra, even in France, England, and New Zealand. Could it actually be possible that some of these creatures managed to survive deep in the swamps and the high peaks of some of the more remote, inaccessible regions, even until the 20th century? In actuality, there is absolutely no conclusive evidence at all to prove the chronology chronology of 65 million years is in any way correct for the extinction of the species. Further evidence even suggests that the event may have in fact occurred a good deal more recently than any other paleontologist who vows his doctorate would ever care to admit. <laughs> I love Max is just good with that little, just a little, yeah, he likes to twist it. Just a little knife to the, to the liver. Just yeah. like, yeah. He likes to twist the knife. <laughs> Definitely. I can also add to that. So in recent times, Dude, that a do a guy I I know a guy that knows a guy. You know a guy who knows a guy who believes he saw pterodactyls hovering over the over the Cunningham, but this gentleman also believes that um, gremlins used to take his wheel nuts off his car, and he actually called in sick one day with that as an excuse. Okay. So, look, how much weight you give this said gentleman's <laughs> sighting, I don't know. But this was just how one of many the funny and stories. what kind of drugs does this man take? A lot. <laughs> and all of them. <laughs> well, look, I don't think we'll, we'll add that into Max's list of evidence, but uh, I appreciate That's all right. It's just anecdotal evidence. Yep. Look, <laughs> look, man, the thing is, I don't disagree with anything that he's saying. Yeah. And I think it was the last episode or one of the ones before where I said there was a time where I dived down the dragon thing and the evidence is not insubstantial. And that's what's interesting. Yeah. Right. And who who are we to say? That's exactly right. With the the thin evidence that is the fossil record mm -hmm. and the 
geological stratum dating that we used that we use mm-hmm. to date some things mm-hmm. um and just the lack of knowledge the, we have about the planet and everything else like that the lack well. of knowledge we have about the planet the crustal displacement mm-hmm. that that occurs and the recycling of the crust and the mm-hmm. loss of evidence mm-hmm. that that we believe occurs mm-hmm. and the cataclysms that have struck the earth not to mention the the one thing we are talk that we're talking about a, a cataclysm 65 million years ago yeah and then every other cataclysm that has occurred after that erasing that mm. evidence from the earth so as to what really happened yeah you know so to say that something could not have been, could not have lived when obviously a lot of things did like i said crocodiles sharks snakes i think crocodiles goes date back to like 130 million yeah. years it, like there's fossils mm. so they were one of the few things that did fossilize probably mm. because of where they live mm. um mm. you know so it it's it's the perfect place to fossilize things and the other thing about dragons or winged creatures is it's another story that echoes through every single culture bar none yeah well there's even stories of big birds creatures down here as well yep. Right, there's even big stories of big flying bird creatures. Yep. Oh man, another good episode. I'm glad we hung on for that because that was really cool. We have to. We, well, it looks to... like next time we're going to do a little bit more of dragons, like mm. into with the dragons of into George. folklore, yeah, so and stuff be... like that. So explain some of those stories, and then mm. where are we moving after that? Let's do a little preview. Where do we go after the dragons of St. George? The my man? Oh yeah, so all the evidence. Ooh, oh, of, he's going into. Oh, there you go. Is that uh, the one in? Where are we? Strain Aborigines. Aboriginals have stories of a creature called a Yaru, which they say once dwelt in rainforest waterholes. Okay. Strikingly similar to a plesiosaur, mm. which. Back to the. Well, you're talking about Loch Ness. The fo- no, yeah. no, but back to the fossil record that is mainstream. Um, a mine I worked at years ago actually had plesiosaur um, backbone, or vertebrae. Mm. Like we dug them out of the pit. Wow. Sort of thing. Because we're, so we're in the middle of Queensland, oh, the middle of Australia, the western side where of Queensland. Lake, where the inland sea Where was. the inland yeah. sea was meant to have been. Mm. And literally in the pit, there was the clay layer above the layer of soil we have now. It was about five metres and then below that, it went to change to black mud, which had a lot of fossilized mangrove like pods in it. Yeah, right. So they were like, yeah, 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 yeah. They yeah. were like a light, um, light colored sandy stone mm-hmm. sort mm-hmm. of thing. And if you snapped them, they had like rings in them, sort of thing. And they were about eight, look, ask my wife, 12 inches. <laughs> Probably six, yeah, you know what I mean? In realistic four. management. <laughs> but, <laughs> so, and then below that was beach sand. Yeah, pure white yeah, beach right, sand. Right. Yeah. They used to export a lot of that beach sand as as a side hustle. Yeah, right. Yeah, because it was so pure. Yeah, so pure, pure white beach ago. sand locked away. And then below that, it went to rock. Yeah, it was like the bedrock right. layer. And then you started blasting into the rock. So in that black mat layer, did you find, was there some bones that were found in there? Was there? Somewhere between the black mat layer and the, sand like the layer. transition to the mm-hmm. sand yeah, is well. where they found it sort of thing. And they're big vertebrae, like yay big. And now here's the paradigm coming into play. We shipped those off and they got, they got identified as plesiosaur um, vertebrae. On what evidence? By, um, by the experts, by man. the experts, bro, right. <laughs> the people that know these things, right? They right. said it was a plesiosaur. So anyway, that was just yeah, a cheeky little look into it. So we're going into more on dragons and dinosaurs that may not have died out. Mm. I wonder if they do the. I saw a brachiosaurus there. I wonder if yeah. they go into the the one that was in Africa in mm-hmm. the Congo. Yeah, in the Congo, there was that. The, well, I mean, the, the underwater dinosaurs, I mean, there's also those weird every now and again, like oh, when you were talking about orcas earlier, I was thinking, yeah, but every now and again, an orca washes up with a bite taken out of it. 
You know what I mean? Like, we, what? Yeah. What took a bite out of an orca? We and we call them the apex predator because mm. that's as much as we know of. What else is out there in the other ninety five percent of the ocean that we haven't explored? That we haven't explored along with the, I reckon, an easy plus fifty percent of the land that we really haven't explored either. Yep. Oh, well, mate, another good one. Thank you very much, sir. You're welcome. Until next time. In this life and the next. Thanks, guys. Cheers. See ya. Do you want to go again? Let's do it. Yeah. Go again. All right. I know you've been here before. No surprises.